Thank you all for coming out. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. I have the pleasure of getting the evening started and we'll try and be brief because we have a whole roster of, of speakers for you. But let me thank our colleagues at UNLV Libraries for co-sponsoring this event with us. And as always, thanks to our Greenspun College colleagues and staff for making this facility available. They'll be recording the event tonight. We'll have the PowerPoints that you'll see up on our website tomorrow and the video of tonight's event in a few days. Uh, just a, a couple words why we're doing this tonight and not closer to some of the anniversary events of last month. And that's a fairly practical reason. Uh, we didn't know we'd have some of this research even conducted, never mind ready tonight. So we wanted to take advantage of our colleague Carol Graham being out from Brookings. Carol's a tremendous contributor to Brookings Mountain West. She's been in classes, in meetings with faculty and students all week. I hope she has enough voice left to get through tonight. Uh, of course, we're dealing with a, a serious emotional subject tonight, and I want to congratulate and thank my colleagues who will be presenting tonight for how they've tackled this enormously difficult project uh, with, and as I think you'll see, with great grace and sens sensitivity. Of course, we are literally within walking distance of, of the horrible event that occurred here. Uh, you're going to hear some scholarly research on that specific topic, on the larger topic of, of mass shootings as well. Uh, we have a, a printed schedule and agenda for you. We're not big on long introductions here, so you can read those at your leisure and we'll let our speakers get on with their content. Uh, I'm really pleased tonight that we have our own Caitlin Saladino from Brookings Mountain West presenting, in addition to Carol. But I'm even more pleased, if that's possible, that we have two UNLV students joining in the presentation tonight. And couldn't be prouder of both of them. The, uh, I should point out that among their many accomplishments, they're both pursuing the Brookings Public Policy minor here. So we have a special affinity for these two students. We have a, a lot to cover, so I want to get out of the way and bring up our first speakers, Carol and Mary. Um, so thank you, Bill. This is a sort of, uh, this is a new topic for both of us, uh, certainly new for me since I typically work on life satisfaction and well-being. Um, so gun violence is sort of the opposite of that. But I have also been doing a lot of work on unhappiness in the US, divisions, inequality, deaths of despair. Maybe it fits in there. But per, it, the, the approach that we use to measuring well-being is particularly relevant to understanding what we call the unobservable costs of mass shootings, the psychological and other costs that we can't observe by counting deaths or all the, the sort of the normal metrics. Yet we know that there, the costs to these events, to society, are very large. And how can we get a handle on that and measure them? So 96 Americans are killed every day by firearms, um, which is a pretty daunting number. There are no, more guns per capita in the US than I think any other developed country. Um, and the toll includes the mass shootings, 133 individuals killed in Las Vegas, in Nevada, um, in Orlando, in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and other mass shootings. And tragically, that figure doesn't include the two most recent mass shootings in Philadelphia and in California. So gun violence is really a marker of US life. Um, one of the things that stands out about the US in terms of well-being and life satisfaction and stress is that the U.S. has lower average levels of life satisfaction and higher levels of stress than other countries of comparable and even lower income levels. Um, part of this is due to unequal opportunities, the decline of blue collar jobs, and the associated deaths of despair, premature mortality due to suicide, a drug overdose, alcohol disease, and other indeterminate deaths among middle aged, less than college age whites. But some of this might also be due to gun violence. That's, that's hard to measure in the context of overall mortality rates. But I would argue it may be associated even with the deaths of despair at some level. 
So how can we measure these costs? Um, we use subjective well-being measures, so life satisfaction, how people evaluate their lives as a whole, optimism about the future, stress and worry, and other, a few other markers, which we have in the Gallup daily data. I'm an advisor to Gallup, and we have, there's a whole big world poll, but for the, and we may eventually do some international comparisons, but for the US, we have 1,000 Americans surveyed a day, a nationally representative sample, from 2008 until the present. So that means that we can isolate the timing and the place of particular events, um, particular mass shootings. Um, and we focus in particular on Orlando, October 1, Sutherland Springs. Um, there are some others in the latest part of the presentation. And we ask three questions. Local effects, are, this, are these costs of mass shootings worse for people living in close proximity to the shootings? Are there sympathy effects? So are the costs higher for populations that have recently experienced a mass shooting when there's another one somewhere else in the country? And are there adaptation or acclimation effects? So has the US population become accustomed to the carnage and death associated with, with mass shootings as they become more frequent? So Mary's going to be answering those questions. Let me just say a couple of words about the metrics so that you understand what, how we measure this, because it, it's important to understand how we come up with these estimates. So well-being measurement is basically a collaboration between economists and psychologists. It's grown quite dramatically to the point that um, governments, like the government of the UK, have these metrics in their official statistics. So we've gone from the crazy fringe to the mainstream, so to speak, in developing these metrics. We can answer questions as diverse as the effects of commuting time on well-being, why cigarette taxes make smokers happier, and why the unemployed are less unhappy with higher local unemployment rates. And if those questions are intriguing, I can answer them in the question period. Basically, this is a method that's very well suiting the welfare effects of situations where individuals don't have the agency to make a choice, or when consumption decisions are not the result of optimal choices at all. So think about macro and institutional arrangements individuals can't change, like inequality or bad governance. Those arrangements may affect people's well-being, but it's hard for them to exercise a choice right, the, to say that, that it affects their well-being or not. Behaviors that are driven by imposed norms, addiction or self-control problems like smoking or obesity, um, low expectations among discriminated populations, and then high levels of violence and death caused by random gun violence or mass shootings. These are things you can't do anything about. They're not in your control, not as an individual. Um, how do those affect people? We can't observe a choice, right? It, they just happen to be there when it happened or it happened to be in their neighborhood or in their state. Um, so very quickly, two quick slides on measurement, and I'll turn it over to Mary. Probably nobody wants to see a slot, an equation, and probably n even less at 6 o'clock um, at night. But if you hate equations, just focus on this. We aren't asking people if particular things make them happy or unhappy or stressed or worried. We have these large end samples. The Gallup Daily is over a million people well over a million people, and we measure the well-being of individual I at time t. So when we take the survey, that could be their life satisfaction, their optimism, their stress, or their worry. Um, we then control for demographic and socioeconomic traits like income, age, um, gender, employment status, rural, urban, where they live, all kinds of stuff, um, health status. And then we have um, you know, lots of things we can't observe because there's a lot that's innately determined about well-being. But what is really consistent is the patterns and the standard determinants of life satisfaction, not just in the US, but around the world. So income does matter. It doesn't, more and more income doesn't make people more and more happy, but people with means can choose the life they wanna, can live and want to live. Age, I'm gonna end with that because it's actually relevant, very relevant to what's going on in the US. Health matters, employment, social relationships, marriage, all these things are consistently associated with well-being across people of all different income levels in countries and time around the world. So there's something quite consistent about well-being across populations, which is why it makes it a good way to measure things that we can't measure with income measures. Um, and age, this will make you happy or unhappy depending where you are on this curve, but this is years of age and level of happiness. And there, this is a, a very standard U-shaped curve between age and happiness, controlling for age-adjusted health and a couple of other things. This holds around the world, populations around the world. And then what also 
holds is an inverse U in stress at about those same middle age years. All kinds of explanations. I don't have time to go into all of them, but there is certainly a middle age crisis, double financial burdens, aspirations aligning with reality, emotional wisdom as people age, appreciate life more. Um, there's also selection bias because happier people live longer. So the, as you go up the curve, more of the unhappy people have died off. Again, what makes the US unique is that in this area, people are dying of preventable deaths due to deaths of despair. And unfortunately, and more to the point today, people at all different parts of this age curve, and most tragically in this part of the age curve, are just dying randomly because of gun deaths. And we really stand out as a society in the world for that trend. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Um, so the first part of our study looks at local effects, um, which is seeing if people in, pro in closer proximity to a mass shooting um, react differently to those that are further away. And we are able to evaluate this uh, by taking six of the variables that are found in the Gallup Daily Poll, and then taking a weekly average uh, of those variables between different populations strata. Uh, so one of our constrictions for this study is um, the number of observations. We want to make sure that when we look at results, we have uh, enough observations that we can be confident uh, with, with, with what we're looking at. Um, so that is why we are comparing uh, state uh, averages versus the uh, USA as a whole averages. And the states that we are looking at um, focus on um, the two deadliest uh, mass shootings that the U.S. has suffered, which is the Orlando um, nightclub shooting that occurred in Florida in 2016, and the deadliest shooting which occurred here in Nevada last year. Um, and so. Um, what, what you see he, here in these graphs are actually deviations uh, of the weekly averages uh, from an overall average for that specific variable that year. And um, this provides us uh, the benefit of just focusing on the relative changes and allows us to show more distinctly the effects that we see because of the mass shootings. And we actually save your eyesight by not inundating you with, uh, with an overabundance of data points. Um, so because we're still very much in the process of analyzing um, all of this data and because of the unfortunate fact that America suffers so many mass shootings, um, these are very tentative results, so bear with me for a second. Uh, I will talk more generally about um, the sort of effects that we are seeing. Uh, so in the first two variables that you see, which is life satisfaction and life satisfaction in five years, uh, which looks at um, the optimism that people have for the future, we see uh, a pretty consistent trend in life satisfaction between states, uh, which are Florida is in blue and then Nevada is in red, um, between the states and the U.S. population where um, actually during the week of the shooting, which is indicated by week zero on all of the graphs, um, that life satisfaction actually increases the week of the shooting. And um, after the shootings, there are, there are several different events. Um, but when we compare this variable to um, the optimism that people have for the future, we actually see uh, an, an um, increase um, an, an increase in the optimism um, that people hold in the future in the U.S. population um, versus in Florida we actually see a temporary decrease in future optimism and then it uh, increases sharply the next week. Uh, what is notable about this variable is um, that the week of the, sh of the shooting, the uh, optimism that Nevadans um, um, experienced uh, increased by 20% that week. And we see the next week, of course, it, it, it decreased by more than 20% um, the, the, the following two weeks. Um, the next two variables that we look at are... A Can I just jump in one mm -hmm. the word on the, the, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this divergence between life satisfaction and optimism? 
in a way reflects almost a coping mechanism, right? Things are awful today, but they've got to get better in the future. You'll see that change over time in later stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, an experienced worry, an experienced trend. Uh, with this variable, we don't really see um, much consistency. Um, what usually happens is um, this variable seems to be influenced more by the day-to-day -day, um, experiences that people face versus more uh, big picture, uh, long, uh, big uh, events like a mass shooting. But what is notable um, is uh, experience stress the week after actually decreased, um, let's see, by uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Florida by more than 20% and um, in Nevada more by 40%. Uh, but again, th this oscillates uh, greatly. Um, the next two variables that we focus on are uh, the sense of community pride and the, the sense of safety and security. Um, what we can see is that um, the, um, this, the, the shooting had a mass effect on um, uh, the, the sense of community pride that Nevadans had. Actually, it, it decreased significantly the week of and actually kept pretty uh, well below the average uh, for that year. Uh, versus in Florida, it actually um, increased the week of the shooting, but then in subsequent uh, weeks decreased there as well. Um, in sense of safety, there was a far more prolonged um, effect on Nevada than in Florida. Uh, where in Florida you see an effect basically the week of the shooting, but then uh, the average goes back up. Uh, versus in Nevada, the average decreases and stays, um, actually continues to decrease the following two weeks um, after the shooting. And um, I mean, you have a divergence here, um, which is actually the week after uh, Thanksgiving, but then it, it decreases again. Um, and actually, this decrease again corresponds to another mass shooting, which is the Sutherland Springs shootings that occurred in Texas. Um, so then the second part of, of this study looks at sympathy effects. And um, basically, if you, if you are a population strata that has suffered a mass shooting, uh, we want to see if uh, you react with more sympathy um, or um, just more sensitivity uh, to another shooting that occurred afterwards elsewhere. Uh, so now these graphs are a little bit different. What you see on the, let's see, the left side is um, the reactions of the individual states. On the right side are the reactions uh, for um, the U.S. as a whole. And we are looking at the reactions after the Nevada shooting and the reactions after the uh, Sutherland Spring uh, shooting in Texas. And so um, this is where it gets a little bit uh, tricky to actually evaluate um, the, the certain effects. But generally, what we see is a lag of reaction. Um, and we um, see that um, the, uh, there is a greater negative effect to the Nevada population for the Texas shooting than the Florida population to the Texas shooting. Uh, this might be due because uh, this might be an effect since um, the Nevada shooting um, was only a month before the Texas shooting. Um, let's say some of the worries and concerns would have been much more alive for the people living in Nevada um, than the people living in Florida who had experienced um, such a tragic event of, well a year before uh, that. Um, and so, but again, we see a similar trend where the week of the shooting, the life satisfaction in uh, five years goes up. And it again goes up more for people in Nevada than people in Florida. Um, in uh, the U.S. population, we again see a lag in the reaction for the Nevada shooting. Um, so as opposed to the Texas shooting where there was a steep decline of uh, life satisfaction averages the week of, but then it, it really um, um, returned uh, to its former average the week following. 
um, versus Nevada, it, it took a little bit longer to recuperate the average. Um, so for these, um, it, I don't think we will actually have enough time to discuss this in detail, so I'm going to uh, skip over these for now. If you want to uh, come and discuss with uh, Carol and I after the talk, you're more than welcome to, and I will skip over this. So the um, last part uh, of the study um, looks at more um, general um, a big picture effects, which is, um, is the United States as a whole becoming adapted, uh, acclimated uh, to the mass shootings uh, that we are facing? And so what we th did in this case is um, because we're looking at the U.S. Um, population as a whole, we can then uh, uh, just focus on the week of the shooting. And uh, the main point that uh, we see here is that um, there really isn't um, an acclimation to the mass shooting. In fact, it's the opposite case where as the shootings continue, and so uh, le let me explain the axes real quick. Um, this, um, these are um, six of the shootings um, on the left side are the shootings um, that happened um, in, in 2012 and so forth. So time moves this way. Um, so, um, and this has been the, the most recent um, mass shooting in the study. Um, and so, as time continues, we actually see a more profound um, decline of life satisfaction the week of the shooting. And um, we see a general trend towards having less and less hope uh, for the future um, the week of the shooting for uh, the U.S. population. Um, for the experienced worry and stress, there really isn't um, a, um, a consistent trend that we see, um, except maybe for stress as it continues to, to decrease as, as more and more shootings um, occur. Um, as well as for the community pride, um, we, um, well, we do see somewhat of a trend. It's still um, a little bit inconsistent. Um, one of the things that we want to do and one of the next steps of the study is to look at um, how big of a role does media coverage play with these reactions. So for example, uh, the, f uh, the October 1st event, because it, it was such a, um, th the death toll was so high, it, it got a lot of um, media attention, probably than some of the other ones here. And, and so we want to see if, if any of these inconsistencies of, can correlate to those kinds of differences in, in media uh, representation. And so some of our tentative conclusions, and Carol, please add, um, is that uh, we can see very clear and measurable psychological costs uh, that mass shootings have on U.S. populations. Uh, there are definitely local effects that we face uh, when we look at the Florida and Nevada shooting. Um, and then, in contrast, the same population display increased optimisms for future compared to the U.S. as a whole, uh, which may reflect um, resolve and community spirit and, and coming together um, in order to deal with such a, a negative and tragic event, uh, such as a mass shooting. Um, when we look at the sympathy effects, um, we see um, that mass shootings um, Th that response to, there is a response to mass shootings elsewhere, and um, in Nevada there was definitely a response to a mass shooting um, th that was uh, more apparent than in Florida, um, which may be due to um, having um, that shooting in closer uh, proximity of time to the um, Texas shooting. Um, and then uh, for adaptation, uh, we see some trends, but um, there's, uh, we definitely do not see that there is an uh, adaptation um, to uh, these shootings in the U.S. population. And so uh, one of the things that we're going to do right now, we're just looking at uh, the weekly averages. Uh, the next step is, uh, again, taking a look at the media coverage and then uh, moving forward with um, 
a more, um, with more data analysis that actually takes a look at um, linear regressions um, and looks at, at those, um, at how different racial groups um, and, and different demographic groups um, at, are affected uh, by mass shootings over time. So with that, I think, uh, Carol, do you want to add anything? All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for your attention. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Just a second. Dress has pockets. We'll get there. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here. Um, uh, my name is Caitlin Saladino, and I'll start with the disclosure that I am a resident and native of Las Vegas. Um, and so is my co-author, um, although he's not here this evening. Um, and I want to also acknowledge that the sort of inception point for this research started with a conversation with um, our executive director at Brookings Mountain West, Robert Lang, um, in the 24 hours following uh, the 1 October tragedy. Um, we were actually in Miami on business when this occurred. Um, and as a resident of Las Vegas, to wake up to the news that your hometown had become the site of the most um, deadly mass shooting in modern American history was um, something you never really expect to happen. Um, and so it started with conversations in Miami um, with some of the colleagues we were meeting with there. And uh, what I found interesting in that initial um, first 24 hours is our colleagues in Miami said things like, you know, we're so sorry to hear what happened back home. Um, but then followed that with, I was just there last year, I know exactly where that happened. Um, and that got us thinking, there's something different about this particular mass shooting. Um, because of the global prominence of uh, the city that we call home. Um, a lot of people even in Miami were able to relate directly to um, our city and that really got us thinking, you know, how do you memorialize a site like this in a city like Las Vegas? Um, and so I do also acknowledge that when we presented this research um, a few months ago in April at the Midwest Political Science Association conference in Chicago, that this was a very different presentation um, and giving it here back home is different. So I appreciate um, your understanding of the sensitivity of this topic and appreciate Bill acknowledging that up front and I'll do my best to sort of cover this um, from a social scientific standpoint, um, acknowledging a way of thinking about this tragedy um, as researchers. So I wanna start off tonight by talking about Las Vegas, the city as a unique place. Um, it's frequently talked about as the most authentic, inauthentic place, and I think you can sort of agree with that if you're a longtime resident, um, or even if you're you know, new to Las Vegas, but Las Vegas, from a global standpoint, is so good at being inauthentic that it, the skyline itself is globally recognizable um, for drawing replicas out of other cities in the most authentic way. Um, and all of this is done to serve tourists and the industry and to make Las Vegas constantly adaptable and relevant. So if we think about the 1990s in Las Vegas, I mean, those who are residents for a long time can remember the MGM Adventure Park that was there for drawing families to Las Vegas. The TI was formerly the Treasure Island. Um, lots of things to draw families um, in. But Las Vegas is adaptable and quickly learned that families are very frugal travelers and adapted that model to draw people in in different ways. So today, Las Vegas is obviously a global leader in live entertainment, in fine dining, um, and in nightlife. Um, but all at the end of this, 
Las Vegas is, has perfected this sort of money-making venture, constantly remaining relevant by adapting in real time. And one of the ways that this has happened, and I'm sure some of you will recognize this, is through the demolition and um, an implosion of existing casinos to make way for new casinos. I have these really vivid memories of being really young and sitting in the back of my dad's pickup truck that we've pulled up to like a dirt lot uh, just a few miles off the strip and put a blanket in the back of the truck and watching these implosions happen. I distinctly remember the Hacienda Casino and the Aladdin and I'm sure some of you do as well. But I think that's an interesting dynamic when we think about memorialization. Um, and it gives us as residents sort of this collective memory to say, you know, remember when the SLS was the Sahara. Um, the site of the tragedy itself, however, um, is a little different. Uh, there's this concept in sociological theory of space versus place, and I'll kind of quickly run through this, but the idea being that spaces exist in society and they don't turn into places until people interact with those spaces and assign meaning to it. Um, the location of where the One October tragedy happened has been this space that has been in flux for many years. A parking lot for residents, or for, for casino employees, excuse me, um, can be transformed into a concert venue one week and set up for American Ninja Warrior the next. Um, completely adaptable. Um, so it doesn't carry with it a collective memory or a public memory that we all recognize of that used to be that. Um, but on the night of 1 October, it was transformed into a meaningful, rhetorical, emotional place um, that now carries that meaning with it forever. Um, so even in a place like Las Vegas, um, where this land is you know, incredibly valuable, a meaningless space still existed and now has this place meaning to it. So on one hand, we're situated on the Las Vegas Strip in what would be considered from an urban planning standpoint, this profane, urban, workaday uh, place. But at the same time, now there's this location that has a level of sacredness to it. And so with all of those things in mind, um, and the opposition of that sacredness to the surrounding landscape, um, we were led by the following question. You know, in memorializing the site of the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history, how does a city like Las Vegas get it right the first time? And so as a policy scholar, I turned to um, a, a way of kind of thinking this through that really focused in on listening to the narratives that emerge naturally in the days following. Um, my co-author and I looked um, specifically at newspaper articles um, and other things that were publicly available documents to kind of understand you know, what, what were the responses? What were people saying about what we should do next? Um, and fundamentally, you know, how we communicate matters. Narratives sort of help us make sense of the world around us, and they're a really good way of bringing complex things down to a level that everyone else can understand. Um, so one thing I'll point out just to start is, I think there is power in naming, and there's a lot of research to back this up as well. Um, but when we think about other um, locations of mass shooting tragedy, and Mary and, and Carol even touched on this, we associate the name of the place or the location with the shooting itself, Columbine, Sandy Hook being schools, or in Columbine's case, the community as well. Parkland and San Bernardino, the names of the cities. Um, but for Las Vegas, there's sort of an ambiguity of what we call um, the tragedy. For people outside of Las Vegas, it might be the Las Vegas shooting. For people who were there, um, it's the Route 91 Harvest Festival, and that community has continued to band together and support one another as a result. Um, but 1 October, I thought, was an interesting way of naming it because there is no location identifier there, and that's the name that has stuck. Um, and whereas the media in these other scenarios sort of defines the name of the tragedy, um, our political leaders stepped forward very quickly to say this will be known as 1 October. So narrative policy analysis is actually a really useful framework for understanding complex environments, and especially in the case of the Las Vegas tragedy, I think we can all agree that this is one that's very complex and has a lot of competing interests and, of course, emotion too. Um, the way this framework actually functions is pretty simple to explain, actually. Um, the scholar looks for narratives that exist, identifies which one is dominant, easy enough, the one most prevalent, the counter-narrative, which is one that is in direct opposition, 
then tries to reconcile the fact that those two competing narratives can actually exist in the same place and at the same time by proposing a meta-narrative, which addresses both, and then offers a narrative policy analysis for what should happen next. Um, so I'll run through each of these with what preliminarily we've discovered as a result of um, looking through newspaper. Um, so interestingly enough, the dominant narrative that emerged um, was that we should maintain the status quo. A lot of newspaper inter uh, or press and, and print and uh, news interviews sort of looked into this narrative that was sort of like, we can't live in fear. You know, one crazy person can't ruin it for the rest of us. And really maintains the narrative that the space should be flexible and remain commercially viable. Um, and this is a, a poll that was at the bottom of a uh, review journal article, you can see dated October 21st of last year, that sort of asked um, people visiting the review journal site, you know, what do you think should happen to it? And as you can see, 51% of the respondents indicated concerts should continue there, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so the counter to that was, in our view, memorialization. Um, I actually took the picture on the right myself, I visited um, the Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign just 10 days after the event, um, after I had returned on business. And uh, one of the things I noticed immediately was the obvious breadth of, of memorial items and artifacts that were there, but also the diversity of types of ways to memorialize. Um, whether it was the lay of aloha, which you may recall was woven together by residents in Hawaii and then shipped here um, as an offering sort of to and, and paying homage to the ninth island because of our large Hawaiian population and other culturally relevant items. And of course, the 58 crosses that the man from Illinois built and displayed at the site. Um, but another dynamic that I thought was interesting when I visited was tourists or individuals who were in Las Vegas um, immediately following the event who had planned their vacations were still visiting the signs to get their iconic photos in front of the Welcome to the Fabulous Las Vegas sign. So it was very clear that memorialization at that location would not last um, because there was sort of this um, typical usage of the space. Um, Additionally, we've heard a lot with our colleagues um, from the library about the community healing garden that emerged in days following and was reported all over the nation um, for how quickly the community of Las Vegas responded. Um, interestingly, this site was actually where the community gathered following the Pulse nightclub shooting and also uh, the location where individuals gathered just last week after the shooting in Thousand Oaks. Um, so it's sort of a space that serves multiple purposes. Um, but I think the most interesting part about the Community Healing Garden is although it gained traction nationally as an important um, memorialization effort of the city, city, I think the average person um, in other places doesn't recognize that the Healing Garden is located five miles north of the site of the actual tragedy. The meta-narrative, and I found this really interesting as well, that sort of emerged, gained a little bit of traction and then we didn't hear a whole lot about, um, was this idea that the site should be used for defense and law enforcement. Um, there was a suggestion that a SWAT um, area command station could be partially located on the site. And so using this framework, we can kind of ask ourselves, does this sort of achieve both narratives at the same time as a policy middle ground? Um, because it's only occupying a portion of the site, it could potentially allow for business as usual to continue concerts to continue to be held at the site else beyond that por portion? Um, or, uh, you know, is it a potential memorialization of the efforts of law enforcement? And there was response back from MGM executives on this, um, who of course owns the land, um, saying, you know, this would continue with our history of working collaboratively with law enforcement. But again, has not gained traction, but an interesting sort of interpretation of a policy middle ground. Um, so the policy, the narrative policy analysis at this point would usually transition into offering, you know, next steps, what um, should happen as a result of this investigation of existing narratives. And I still feel as though there's a lot of questions in the air and a lot of things that make Las Vegas a unique profile of tragedy um, that don't lead me to a, a recommendation just yet. Um, for one, there are two two separate sites to this shooting, and this is not something that we find in other locations of mass uh, shootings. 
Um, of course, the site at the Mandalay Bay on the 32nd floor and then the site of the tragedy itself. Um, as you probably recall, the status quo was maintained um, in the first site um, because the building itself, the, the casino itself, is a business and needed to continue to operate as a business. And so you probably saw reports that um, the 32nd floor was eliminated from the numbering of the casino and this happened very quickly and swiftly. Um, the concert venue, because it didn't exist as a meaningful place prior, didn't have an immediate need to be transitioned back into something else. So as you know, it's remained dormant for the past year. Um, another thing about this, and I think Mary touched on this uh, slightly, there's a global, globally recognizable aspect um, to this particular uh, location. Um, we do recognize that you know, there, were, there were six individuals who perished from the Las Vegas community, um, but there are a number of others um, who lost their lives that aren't from Las Vegas at all. A majority of them were Californians, a very large number of them were Canadians, and I don't think that's anomalous. Um, the Las Vegas community on a daily basis responds to tourists from all over the world. Um, so the individuals who attended um, are representative of the community of visitors that we serve. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that there, there's a complex piece of this in terms of a lack of a motive. And um, it's probably clear that we won't know a motive ever for this. Um, but motives and um, understanding them helps people to cope with tragedy. There was a really good quote from a doctor um, named Franklin Brown from the Yale School of Medicine in one of these newspaper articles where he said, you know, people feel more comfortable when they know why something happens in terms of terrible events. And an identified cause can make people feel as though there's an isolated explanation for the problem. And it gives people a sense of control. Um, and so not having that motive makes it difficult for our community to gain control over what happened. Um, and so perhaps, arguably, memorialization might be a way to gain back that control over time. Um, and I'll conclude with this just um, this note that I uncovered in some of my investigation as well, is that perhaps it is too soon to talk about memorialization. Um, there was a really great piece that came out, I believe, from the LA Times. Um, immediately following that talked about the memorialization efforts of all of these communities that have unfortunately been impacted by gun violence. Um, uh, Columbine, for example, tried to create a memorial very quickly after the tragedy and it was received incredibly poorly by the community. They simply were not ready to talk about memorialization. Um, Aurora, Colorado, as another example, um, occurred in July 2012. This was the, the shooting at the movie theater, if you recall. Um, they just released their memorial um, in July of this year. And actually, concurrently, we saw the press release locally in July of 2018 that Clark County Commission Chairman and now Governor-elect Steve Sisolak had appointed governor, um, outgoing governor now, Brian Sandoval, to chair the 1 October Memorial Committee. Um, so with that in mind, uh, while it's not entirely clear what will happen, the committee seems like a good starting point to ensure that the correct constituent groups are brought together to make a decision on this and that consulting with the community happens over time before a decision is made. And I will leave you on this thought and I am pleased to turn over um, the presentation today to my colleague at UNLV Libraries, uh, Barbara Tabak. Thank you. I'm representing <coughs> the Oral History Research Center at UNLV Libraries. Uh, Clay T. White is not with me this evening, obviously. Uh, Clay T. and I together have collected over uh, 50 interviews about remembering 1 October. Um, approaching this project was difficult. Most of the projects that we work with in the Oral History Research Center deal with demographic groups, neighborhoods, uh, never an event, and especially never an event as tragic as this was for our community. 
Among the people that we interview, and I will reference him again, is David Becker, who took this photograph. He was um, hired as a freelance photographer for all of the uh, Route 91 festival, um, and this is a shot that he took of the crowd um, moments before everything went dark. I thought about many ways that we could have looked at um, the interviews that Clay T and I have collected uh, for this project, and um, I'm going to string some quotes together and create a story of the evening and what transpired afterwards. Um, anyone who might come and look at our collection might find another way to string the stories together, but it shows you that within each interview, which might have lasted 20 minutes uh, or up to two hours, um, as it did with the coroner, can be used in many ways. Um, I'm going to go back th to this picture. At the same time that David is taking this photograph, across the street, um, the Golden Knights were just uh, down the strip a little ways at the T-Mobile Arena, playing an exhibition game. And um, leaving that game at the, uh, was the coroner, John Feudenberg. And uh, also, leaving the game shortly after him, was Sergeant Detective um, Steve Ryback, who um, had been working on his off-duty hours as uh, security at the game. At the festival was Danielle Mc, uh, McLaughlin. Danielle uh, is an annual attendee mother of two, she and her husband, uh, had celebrated an anniversary the year before um, at the festival. And this year, and it's not a very good picture, but it's off of her phone, um, and in her quote, she says, we lit literally took a picture two minutes before the shooting started of all of us. We did a selfie group picture, and then it was like, that was weird, because on your phone it says 10.04, and the shooting, I think, started at 10.06. The document, documenting of the event begins. This is another one of David's um, photographs. He actually didn't know what he was shooting, at, shooting his camera at. Uh, he just was shooting in the dark. Uh, and that's kind of the way our oral history project was. We were in, shooting into the dark uh, as far as what kind of questions were we going to ask? Were people going to be interested in telling us their stories? And building that trust is something that we're accomplished at, but this was difficult. And I will mention, um, just a footnote, uh, just based on my previous experience in working with Holocaust survivors, I thought it was important that Clay T and I do some uh, mental health preparation, and we did have a conversation over dinner one night with a psychologist who has worked with uh, uh, veterans and got his consultation on how we would approach our taking care of ourselves, because this was obviously a sad topic. Amber Diskin is another attendee, and she says she vague, vaguely remembered saying, what's happening, what's happening? And at this point, she looked at her watch and she knew it was 10.08, and that was forever burned into her memory. She called her husband, and the only thing she could think about was that she wanted to be home with her boys. David Becker, the photographer, said, people can say that you were at the right place, at, or at the right time, at the right place. I say, it was. I say I was at the right time at the wrong place, or the wrong time at the right place. He really is very confused about where he was at and what he was doing, because um, within a few months after his photographs were published, he won the largest world prize that a photographer can win for their phot photographic work. A great honor, but a humbling um, moment in his life. This is the headline from the uh, announcement of the awards that he had won. He was there to photograph a concert that turned into a massacre. And among the people in this picture who were unidentified, we know that we were going to interview people like this, and we have. 
There were the first responders. There would be lift drivers, people who would donate blood. There was one victim, that uh, survivor, Nick Rabone, who we did interview, and Nick enlightened us right away. He felt it was very important that all of, uh, people know that he did survive, and an amazing thing happened to him that shortly after the event and th that he, his name was published, there were um, people from the Pulse shooting that reached out to him. He then in turn, when the uh, Sutherland Springs uh, shooting occurred in Texas, reached out to victims of that uh, shooting so that he could share his story and offer support. Nick is an assistant hockey coach and uh, an amazing man who tells us that there's been a, f a lot of feelings that have come through me. Obviously one being anger, two being very grateful. That's probably the top of the list. I'm very, very grateful. I'm blessed. I was more fortunate than 58 other people. John Feudenberg, um, the Clark County coroner. It's hard to imagine um, the scene that he walked into, but his words and his need to tell the story, and I think that's what really transpired for Clay T and I as we, with each narrative that we collected, is that there was a need to tell the story. We didn't, you know, nag anyone to, to tell us their story. In fact, people would just sort of suggest people. We approached it very passively. And John um, sat down, he was by far the longest interview in, uh, I actually broke it into two sessions. A very humble man, but also a man who paints a very vivid picture. And this is the quote that is probably one of my favorites, both Clay T and I teared up when he started describing the scene of the red solo cups floating um, across the uh, now empty site of the, the festival that's scattered with, um, he, he describes the, the cell phones going off and the light that they are creating. And then we would hear about the same imagery later from first responders uh, who, in fact, one firefighter who I've not interviewed but did tell me um, separately said that his, members of his firefighting team silence their phones now because they, there's, there's something that triggers in their memory when they hear their phone ring. It's, it's, it's burned in. Laura Sussman um, is a funeral director and co-owner of Kraft Sussman Funeral Services here in Las Vegas. Uh, she talks about um, that it was really, really bad as I mentioned at the start of the interview, dealing with parents after a child passes away for whatever reason is bad. But something like this when they were just murdered was heart-wrenching. Just being there with the families and crying, it was okay to be who I am and they appreciated it and I knew that we were right there with them. As with other stories that I'm going to, to highlight the sense of human kindness starts shining through and it never goes away. In fact, it's the thing that is our biggest takeaway. Rabbi Sanford Axelrod is a, a community leader in an interfaith uh, group of, of uh, ministers and um, from, from all faiths. And his, his was a very distressing interview um, and then he talked about he, all the calls that he got, you know, people wanted to be of help, and that's, I mean, even those of us that weren't, you know, country music lovers were being, you know, given, you know, receiving calls from our friends and family, making sure we're okay. Um, what can we do for you? What can we do for your community? And he, um, through his interview, came up with a, this uh, need for a template, he said, of what do you do in a community to help grieve, and that there should be a template, and I think that is only amplified by the increased number of shootings that are occurring. You get to meet, when you do an oral history, you get to meet amazing people who do amazing work. This was an organization I really was not 
too familiar with, um, and sadly know a great deal, is TIP, which is the Trauma inter, uh, Intervention uh, Program. And Jill Roberts was um, uh, happy to talk about their work, a uh, lot of volunteers. She talks about two days after October 1, um, getting an email, and it was from a high school student back east. That's all she knew. She had just identified herself as that. She said, me and a few of my classmates figure your organization is probably really busy with one October and we want to do something to help. Can we send thank you notes to your volunteers? She said that they had done a little research and found her organization. She continued, Jill says, I was so busy trying to catch up with emails, but something just touched me in that like, wow, someone clear across the country. I said, sure. And I sent her a list of the first names of our volunteers so they could be personalized. I just thought, oh, that's really cool. And when I got the box was when I broke down because it was from Sandy Hook High School. All the kids that participated in that were either at the, at the school or had siblings that had died. It wasn't the high school, but that, I think that's a misspeak. We have lots of uh, physicians who, uh, trauma physicians who were interviewed, um, or several, and they were all poignant and collectively, if the medical field wanted to read their oral histories, they would get a feel for how uh, one might organize uh, the triage, you know, how to take care of their own people, uh, how to react, how to work with other hospitals. But I thought that Dr. Chestovich uh, from UMC's uh, teaching uh, trauma surgeon, he said, I'm proud of the work we do but it disappoints me in a way that we have to do our best work when society is at its worst. But he was so um, exhausted after working 12 hours straight that he, he needed to do something. And so he walked outside UMC and snapped this photograph of the sun coming up the next morning. And he talks about he knew there would be another day. You think you know everybody in your life and you talk about these events. This woman happens to be um, someone I do personal training with, and so I've known her for the last eight months or so. Never once did one October come up in our conversations, and I see her at least twice a week. And I started learning that she was a Red Cross volunteer and that we, I mentioned that we had interviewed a Red Cross, um, the CEO, the, past CEO of Red Cross for this project. And she said, well, I, um, I was on call on October 1st. And so began our second year of, of collecting oral histories. The first year we got the, over 50 and um, with Zoe and another person, we, we have started getting the memories of people a year later and seeing how it feels for them as well as for us. Zoe says, on October 2nd this year, one of our lead volunteers invited her, invited everyone to her house, and we had a really big dinner at her house just so that we could be together, just to hug, just for the high, higher ups to say thank you. It was people from the blood services, Red Cross bl blood services, just our office people, our disaster response people. That was really good. That was a good healing thing after October 1st for us. We kind of end up taking care of ourselves. Zoe had um, been a, a volunteer at Hurricane uh, Katrina, and she was on call that night because so many of the other Red Cross volunteers from Las Vegas were, um, and I forgive me, there was another hurricane going on, and she, they were, um, there, I, know, I think it must have been in Florida. Um, and so the staff was small. But she talks about how you need to be strong and that you will heal. I thought it was really important um, to, to 
say thank you to her and to all of you for, for the research you're doing. Our work is really, um, it's personal. We delve into the stories, but people don't share what they're not ready to share. And they take us where they want to. Uh, it will be interesting, one of the aspects that Clay T and I would like to explore going forward is to maybe re-interview some of the people that we interviewed immediately or you know, the few months afterwards to see how they f reflect now. Um, already, anecdotally, I've had people tell me you know, during their interviews that no, they would never go to the site again, no, they would never go to a Route 91 uh, festival again, and now when I run into them, they go, well, I wish we would have had another Route 91 festival. You know, I'm healing. I think the community is healing. Um, but the thing that, again, I, I said earlier that Clay T and I both agreed on that is the acts of human kindness that we hear in the stories, the people who laid on strangers to keep them alive, the first responders who um, didn't know where they were going and stayed for hours until um, their day seemed done. But I appreciate the opportunity to share some of our work with you. We don't always get a chance to talk about it, but um, I think it's like stringing the stories together to tell the story of the evening, and there are many ways to do it. Thank you. <laughs> and la last but not least, <laughs> Thomas and uh, Miranda. Can you hear me? Good. Do you want a mic test? Check one, check two. Okay. I think we're good. Uh, okay, we're good then. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the organizers um, and uh, thank our co-panelists. Um, some really valuable uh, contributions to um, a, a pretty difficult topic. Uh, my name is Thomas Padilla. I'm the visiting digital research services librarian. Uh, here at UNLV Libraries. This is my colleague, Miranda Berry, uh, a student here at UNLV and also the library's first uh, social media data curation specialist. Um, we're really eager to share with you uh, basically the library's work um, collecting and uh, now aiming to support the use of the 1 October Twitter data collection. Uh, we have a couple of core objectives uh, for our talk as we kind of like close things out. Uh, one is to announce the availability of the collection for community use. Um, we're, we're really proud of, of that effort. It was truly uh, a library-wide effort, even really a community-wide effort, seeking feedback from ex experts in the U.S. and, and, and further abroad. Uh, we're going to introduce the collection, just sort of uh, talk with you a bit about what we're seeing in it, uh, perhaps what some of the research questions could be, uh, what some of the technical challenges are, what some of the ethical challenges are, um, and so forth. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about charting sort of uh, various ways that we imagine supporting use of the collection. Um, and then finally, we just have a, a call for collaboration. Um, as we engage you know, more and more of the challenges that this collection poses, uh, it, it would be really good um, to collaborate with you all. So, oh, oh I got the slides down there, okay. Um, so, it was, oh, there's two. Okay, sorry. Um, so a bit about collection background, the, the process of collecting uh, these particular data. Uh, my first day of work at UNLV Libraries was the day after the October 1 shooting. Um, so it was a difficult day. Uh, I, as I mentioned it, you know, just a second ago, I'm the visiting digital research services librarian. It's like, what does that mean? Um, well, among the many things that it could mean is that uh, I work a lot with data and with digital stuff. So the text mining, the data mining, the interacting with APIs, um, kind of like a, a go-to person for that kind of thing. Um, and you know, so I had that kind of frame of mind in place uh, on my first day when I was seeing sort of various types of initial community reactions. Um, sadly, one of the first places I went to um, was uh, a project that a number of archivists are working on called Documenting the Now. Um, which is a large-scale uh, social media data archiving effort that arose um, in the Ferguson protests uh, following the, the killing of Michael Brown. Basically, archivists were seeing a lot of social activism, a lot of organization online, and they thought, we need to develop tools in order to capture this 
part of the contemporary record for uh, research, for community understanding, and so forth. Um, so I, I, you know, I went to work uh, uh, in collaboration with a lot of colleagues uh, across the library. Um, there wasn't really precedent for doing this kind of work, um, but there was all of the will in the world to do it. And you know, it, it felt important at the time, and I, and I think the sense of importance has only really grown um, as time has passed. There was a concerted effort, and there continues to be a concerted effort in special collections to uh, document and uh, support um, community interpretation of One October. Um, you did just hear about the uh, oral histories that are being collected. Uh, in addition to the oral histories, we also have a web archive collection. So this is archiving uh, local, national, international uh, websites, uh, often news sites that, uh, that attempts to um, uh, react to the event, document the event, and so forth. Um, there were some like preliminary challenges uh, in terms of you know, collecting, collecting data like this. Um, there is the issue of cost. Uh, that wasn't really an issue, I don't think, that was in our mind at the time. Um, but if you are a researcher in that space, in this space, it, it could be a challenge for you. There were issues of sort of time sensitivity. Um, with the public API, uh, which is a, a public application programming interface, um, which is essentially uh, uh, something that you interact with using a programming language to, to get data. Um, the public API, which is free, has a time constraint where basically you have a seven day window to capture data. So if you are um, eight days away from the event and you want to work backwards, it's like a, a moving slider in terms of what you have access to. So there was that challenge. In addition to that, there was the question of how to scope what kinds of data that we would be getting back. Um, and you know, it was kind of a, a difficult question that, that felt like it had real stakes. We didn't really want to miss anything. Um, and so we had conversations with colleagues uh, at, a, at a number of different organizations that had used the same tools to interact with Twitter, to document Black Lives Matter protests, um, to document the um, Orlando shooting, uh, or how people reacted to it um, on Twitter. And basically the cons consensus from those conversations that was that we should choose like the simplest term possible. Um, whereas there may have been some you know, initial thought around, well, we should try and look at all of the hashtags that people are using, right? But how often is it the case that someone in, in, that is at this event or someone that is adjacent to this event is thinking to use a hashtag? Probably not the case, maybe a ladder formation. Uh, so we ended up focusing on just capturing everything that mentioned Vegas. Uh, we did that uh, for a period of seven days, I think a, a day before the event and a few days after the event, and we ended up getting about 14 million tweets out of that. I do want to stop just quickly to thank uh, specifically all of my colleagues in the library um, that have helped with this project, uh, colleagues uh, that are not at this library, that are from around the country and around the world that have contributed to helping us do this project. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without them. And, you know, Eventually, we, we had all this data, right? the 14 million tweets, the many, many gigabytes. Um, and that raised a series of questions. Right? So it's how do, we support, uh, like how do we support the use of this collection? Right? It's kind of uncharted territory. Uh, at the same time, like what are the kinds of research questions that we should try to support? And you know, linking up with that, what are the tools and methods that would be in common use among researchers seeking to ask questions of these data. So really important questions. We thought it would be useful to have someone to help us explore some of these questions and develop resources. Uh, we appealed to the Library Advisory Board for funding. Uh, we sought to hire someone to help us. We had a very competitive search. Um, Miranda was one of the people that applied. Um, she's been doing an excellent job. And I will now pass off the presentation to her. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, and thank you again to the Library Advisory Board for their continued support of the collection. Um, so today I'm going to walk you through the collection process, give you a little high-level look at what is actually in this data set. We're also going to talk about, like Thomas said, some of the technical and ethical challenge, uh, challenges associated with the 1 October Twitter data collection. And then we're going to wrap up with some areas of research that we've identified that we think um, could be interesting for people on the UNLV campus. 
So beginning with the collection process, like Thomas mentioned, we turn to documenting the now, which is a platform that allows researchers to collect social media data in an ethical way. Now documenting the now is the platform, but we needed the tools to make it happen. The two tools that we used to build this collection out are Twark and a tool called the Hydrator. Now Twark is a command line tool for archiving Twitter JSON data. And we used Twark once we had defined our search term to help build our collection. The hydrator was then later used to help, once we had that collection, later share it with researchers off campus and the greater Las Vegas community. So when we were building this collection, when we were deciding on the search terms, we ended up going with the simple search term Vegas. Um, not Las Vegas, not One October, uh, not Vegas Strong, because our primary goal with this collection was to collect as much information, as much Twitter data as possible around One October. We really wanted to capture the local, national, and international conversations that were happening around this event, and we felt that Vegas would sort of do the trick. And taking a look at the numbers, we found that it did. We had a collection, like Thomas said, of 14,108,104 tweets. These tweets were collected from September 29th to October 7th at 5 p.m. This collection, at like Thomas said, is now available. Today is actually the day that we announced that the collection is available online to download. And these 14,108,104 tweets are in chronological order. We have also removed all duplicate tweets within the data set to uh, make it for anyone who is interested in using this data on campus. It is ready to go, uh, ready to be used. So one of the things um, that gets really interesting when you start breaking down what's actually in this data set is when you break it down by the number of unique users. So in the One October collection, we see that we have over 4 million unique users. And I want to draw your attention to the users with the most tweets. Um, let's see. So we see right here um, at the truth24.us, the user with the most tweets in the collection is actually an account that has been suspended by Twitter. Um, and we believe that this is for suspected bot activity. You're also going to see a lot of references to Third Eye, Third Eye M, TV Third Eye, um, and there's one here as well. So all of these are um, what we refer to as Twitter bots. So these are automated accounts, and these accounts specifically are tweeting out um, information from CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, respectively. So this was sort of our first indication that in this data set that there is a strong uh, presence of bots. And we continue to see the presence of bots once we look at the most retweeted tweets within the collection. Uh, the tweet that I have listed here is not a bot. It is from former President Barack Obama expressing his sympathies and condolences for the family members of the victims. Um, it had over 400,000 retweets at the time of collection. Um, but what was really interesting is that uh, in the top 10 most retweeted tweets, a majority of them were Japanese language tweets that did not mention 1 October, they did not mention Las Vegas, and they were also not um, located in Las Vegas because beyond the actual text of the tweets, what you're going to see in this data set, if anybody from September 29th to October 7th was in Las Vegas tweeting, um, from a certain location that said Las Vegas, we were also able to pull that as well because we were looking at the location. So the most used hashtag within the data set was Las Vegas um, with over 200,000 uses. Um, over here we have the rest of the hashtags. Um, I'd like to call your attention to the uh, Vegas Strong, Mandalay Bay, Breaking, Shooting. We have all of these hashtags that were used to sort of drive the conversation around this event. Um, this sort of goes back to our initial decision to use Vegas as sort of this umbrella term. Had we controlled for location, had we just looked at Vegas Strong or Vegas Stronger, you know, a lot of these hashtags were forming in the days 
days um, after the event. And so even though we collected until October 7th, um, we really wanted to just use that term Vegas to grab as much of this as possible. And it was very exciting for us to see that um, we did, we did, um, were able to pull some of those major tags. So this in particular, this animated GIF, I think is one of the most uh, powerful things in this presentation tonight. So it's about six seconds in total, and at the beginning when it loops again, um, you'll be able to see a number of random GIFs, or sorry, random emojis. Um, as the news started to break of the event, you see an almost immediate wave of prayer hand emojis and crying face emojis um, expressing uh, sympathy. So um, these again were pulled from um, all of the tweets that we have in the data set and it's a way to see in real time how people are responding to these events. Now this is exciting from a research perspective because there are researchers um, across the US that are using Twitter data right now and applying sentiment analysis to understand um, sort of the moods of these events, what happened. Um, at the University of Vermont, we've seen researchers create what's called a hedonometer. Um, they've been measuring average happiness levels on Twitter since 2008, October 2nd, 2017, was the saddest day ever in Twitter history. Um, so they're pulling just a random set of tweets every single day, but they found that October 2nd um, was the saddest day that they had ever recorded. And you can see that clearly here um, just through the use of emojis. So with some of the, with the look um, at that data, you can clearly see that there is a lot of really interesting stories that can be told with this one October Twitter data collections. But there are some also pretty significant technical challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, the first of which being that there is a significant amount of technical skill required to access this data. Um, like Thomas mentioned, uh, you need to be able to program to look at a lot of this. Um, you need to know several programming languages. There are a lot of tools um, that you need to sort of have a handle on before starting your research with this data. And that sort of leads me to my second issue, which is issue, uh, issues that were associated with open source tools. Um, so Twark and the Hydrator, which is what we use to build this collection, are both open source tools. Documenting the Now is a project that is um, it's funded, but a lot of it is volunteer work, and so there are gaps within the documentation. Now, if you are a programmer by trade, this is, you know, this is completely fine, right? This is your wheelhouse. You can navigate these tutorials um, with ease, but if you are someone that is just getting started out, if this is not your wheelhouse, it can actually be really difficult to access and use these tools. The third and probably one of the most difficult to overcome is that Twitter developer access is limited. So Thomas was the one who used Twark to build this collection and Thomas has Twitter developer access. Um, in order to have that, they have recently raised the bar. And so to build future collections like this for any faculty members or students interested, it is going to become uh, more difficult. Some of the solutions that we have come up with for these technical challenges, um, one with the technical skill required and issues uh, associated with some of these open source tools, is that at the UNLV libraries, we are creating and releasing this winter um, a set of tutorials that are going to help students and help faculty navigate the one October Twitter data set, but that doesn't mean that they have to stop there. If there are other data sets out there that they would like to explore um, through these tutorials, the lessons that they learn, uh, this will give them uh, the ability to do so. When it comes to uh, Twitter developer access, one of the best things that we can recommend and that we can provide is, for example, having these collections on campus available to faculty and students. So we're starting with one October and we'll continue from there. But then beyond that, there's also a wealth of collections available out there online, um, not just for One October, but also for, I know Sandy Hook was mentioned tonight in um, Sutherland. These collections exist uh, through documenting the now. They actually have a tweet catalog where they're pulling these collections and putting them all together in one place. Um, but even if you don't have that Twitter developer access, there's still a way to use this data in your research. 
So beyond the technical challenges associated with the One October collection, we also have some pretty serious ethical challenges. I personally could talk about this all night. Um, I think it's very interesting, but I'll leave it at this. Um, with Twitter data, there are people behind this data. Um, there are people who don't necessarily know that you have this data and that you are researching um, that you are looking at what they've said there, specifically with the uh, One October collection, we have a lot of really graphic images. We have a lot of very incredibly personal stories. And so keeping in mind that there are people behind the data and uh, protecting their privacy is part of the reason why we are part of the Documenting the Now community and we are committed to ethical practices when we talk about uh, sharing the data. So these are, I would like to make it clear, these are just some future re uh, research areas that we have identified. Uh, you know, it does not stop here. One of the things, um, one of the reasons why we were so um, looking forward to being invited here tonight is because for anyone in the room that is interested in using these data, we are here to help. And so if there, have question, you know, if there are questions, research questions that you think that this data could provide answers to, um, we're here to help you navigate that. So one of the first areas that we noticed um, was bots. I know I talked about the presence of bots within the data set a little bit earlier, but conversation about the prevalence of bots on Twitter are happening internationally um, right now. You know, these are essentially just little lines of code, sets of instructions, but um, those sets of instructions can shape the way we look at international events um, if the bot strategy is successful. So um, with the One October collection, for example, the question can be asked, uh, did bot shape the conversa uh, conversation around One October? The second would be the community service response. I talked about the hedonometer from the University of Vermont applying sentiment analysis to understand um, you know, the average levels of happiness of a community. How do communities come together? How do they form in times of tragedy? A lot of those answers lie within uh, this, uh, this Twitter data set. Um, the final area that we identified was detection and prevention. Uh, researchers at the University uh, um, of Maryland at Baltimore County have recently completed some research with their own uh, One October Twitter data set on using sentiment analysis to help emergency responders uh, improve their response practices. Um, and so again, there is um, a lot of really exciting um, and you know, interesting ways that we can use this data to understand exactly what happened and also to, to really document and preserve um, uh, the efforts of the Las Vegas community as a whole. And I'd like to end with um, sort of a call to action. We are here to help. If you are in this room tonight and you have, like I said before, research questions that you think can be answered by these data, we want to work with you. And beyond working with you, we want to learn from you. Um, we'll be releasing our set of tutorials uh, starting this winter. And if there's something that you want to see from us, if there is a you know, data set that you would like connected, um, you know, please, please reach out. Thank you. Thank, <coughs> thank you to all my colleagues who joined us on stage tonight. <coughs> I'm just going to uh, conclude things and then our Speakers will be here if you have some questions or comments for them. In, in concluding, I'd just like to say that Las Vegas and UNLV have been my home for 10 years. Like many of you, I came to this city from somewhere else and to this university from somewhere else. I know we have some native-born people here too. But I've never been prouder of, of my city and particularly this university tonight. You heard what this land grant public university can do for its community. And I'm in awe of my colleagues. Carol, I thank you for bringing Brookings national expertise to this topic. Uh, Thomas, thank you for becoming a part of this community so quickly. To the students, and I want to include Caitlin in that, so she's a doctoral student, but uh, I thought I was a successful student when I found the library on campus. <laughs> <coughs> the, 
this is just a little too much to absorb. Uh, but that's what this university can and is doing for this city and this state. Nothing's going to hold this university back from reaching its full potential. And you all are partly responsible for that, so I thank you. And with that, I'll conclude our evening and invite you to come up and talk to any of our speakers. Thanks again for joining us.